Uh, I see shit coming down the pipe. Oh, man. All right, you guys ready to uh, light this candle? Yeah, let's light this candle. All right, welcome to Hammer Factor issue number 17. This wow. is the Dan West edition. Right. On the horn, we have Whitewater Legend, owner of Immersion Research, and all around nice guy, John Weld. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. And also on the horn, we have North Fork Champion, Poker Playing Champion, Outdoor Alliance Policy Council, and all around nice fella, Lewis Geltman. How are you? Doing great. I'm, uh, I'm really excited for the show today. We're going to move past talking about whitewater kayak designs from like the 1990s. <laughs> Talk to <laughs> somebody contemporary, somebody with, with the gravity that our show has been lacking. We're going to go we're gonna get right up. back into uh, 90s creek boat design, I think, next week, basically, with it shaping up. But uh, more on that later. Uh, so, Lewis. It looks like everything is melting out your way. Give us a rundown of what's going on. Oh, man. Um, well, I have my tail firmly planted between my legs. Uh, <laughs> uh, ben Marr and Annie Ulcer Solstice just did the highest yet descent of the Little Way yesterday. Benny ran Spirit at 5'4". Uh, oh, my God. Yeah. Uh Pretty cool, man. I uh, I feel like I had a good run there of playing the who wants to run a little white the highest game. But uh, what was your what was your high water mark? I've done a few around five one. What um, t- describe to our viewers what the little white's like at five feet? It's really fast and really continuous with a lot of holes, and all of the side channels that are normally nothing are potentially like deadly deadly sieves. And if you swim out there at that level, you're, the chances of you drowning are very, very, very high. And everything just happens super, super fast. And, you know, the lines are there and it's good to go, but it's just one thing right after another, right after another, right after another with like horrible, horrible, horrible consequences. And it just gets to a point where for me, I don't know, it's just like exposure time. It's like, how many times can you go out and do this before you, you know, before something happens and you're going to go from plan A to like plan D in about two and a half seconds. (laughs) It's like, so let me ask you a question, right? I've had this theory about risk and people's concept of risk, you know, and I, I developed this while I was teaching kayaking where, you had to sort of deal with people's like they'd say, "Well, I, you know, I took a swim in the lower yacht and I nearly died," you know, in which, of course, you know, it was not the case. Um, but I would consider like someone, you know, most people would live their, their make choices and sort of live their life based on an, an idea that there's a 99.9999 percent certainty that the, what what they're going to do is going to not hurt them or kill them, right? But that if you go to like a 99.9 percent certainty you're getting into crazy time you know when you start making decisions where it's like there's a one in a thousand chance you could die i mean i think that's a considerable risk you know i mean that's like like that puts you into like this bat suit type activities or you know where people do it a thousand times and someone dies right those are the crazy risks i think that sort of puts in perspective the idea of risk but you start talking about things like running the white salmon at five and a half feet. Do you think we're getting into the the low, like literally ninety percent certainty of risk of death, even with someone like as skilled and knows the river as well as those guys? I mean, are we getting truly like Russian roulette style? Uh, no, I don't. Salmon? I mean, I think that there's there's room to operate, but it's just such a fine line, you know. And it's like there's room to recover, there's room to pull it out, but the consequence is very much like, you know, death, I think. Like, I don't know. It's hard to put a number on it. But, you hey, know, if you swam in the middle of getting busy at that level, like, I think that the odds of you're making it to the end of that alive are, like, 50-50. Man, I've been out there at mid-fours, and I was like, this is it. I'll never go back any higher. So a full foot higher than that, like, I mean, that's just off the chain. I mean, 
outside of assessing risk and the whole nine yards is just full on burl. I mean, that's just full on. The thing, I guess the one thing about it is, you know, I think this is really, really true for high water paddling anywhere you go. And that is that, you know, like one of the biggest things that happens is it just gets faster. And if you know the river really, 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 really well, you can slow it back down again because, you know, like when you're whited out or something weird happens, like you don't need that half a second or seconds to sort of like figure out what's going on, make a decision. It's like you already know exactly what you're doing. So it's like, to me, it's almost more impressive when somebody, you know, it doesn't happen very often that somebody will show up from out of town who hasn't run the little way to bunch and will, you know, run it even in the low fours. But to me, that's like super impressive. Like when you can do that without knowing the river really well, because that's, I don't know. I feel like that's the real difference maker for really high descents of like anything. You guys agree with that? I'll agree with that. Yeah. I mean, there's something to be said with, for familiarity. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I guess at a certain point, you know, chaos theory takes over. You, you can only predict so much, you know, the question is how many times, I, I don't know, this is maybe off topic, but how many times could, could those guys do that at that level and not have a life threatening incident? I don't a know. thousand. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. Maybe all of them. So I mean, yeah. those guys are, those guys right. are, Killing it. So, I mean, I don't yeah. know. so how high is it going to go, Lewis? What's uh, what, what is it? Everything still coming up? Have you plateaued out? Is there what, rain in the forecast? I mean, it's just going to be a. I mean, the year is shaping up to be incredible on the entire West Coast. Yeah, it's down a little bit from what it was a few days ago, but it rained last night a little, and there's still a lot of snow on the ground, so it's not really taking much. It's just kind of warming up and starting to get rain on snow, so. I don't know. I mean, it'll be there for whoever might decide they want to run the little way to <laughs> six feet or whatever. I want to come out in one of those like Polish, those Cold War era Polish inflatable balls. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? An Uber <laughs> Die hero, like, John. Like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, moving on uh, from high water, we're kind of going to skip our uh, um, our Lewis Gutman policy. Segment corner. because the Lewis Gellman policy corner. Yeah, the corner of uh, <laughs> the policy nook. <laughs> Lewis Gellman. <laughs> keep that stuff in the corner. <laughs> because we have special guest Dan West. Now, Dan West, um, who wants to fill us in on Dan West? Uh, I am really excited to meet Dan West. Uh, I have not heretofore known him, but he's a kayaker, all around outdoor athlete. I think he worked for World Class Kayak Academy for a bit and also spent some time in DC working, I know, for uh, Montana Senator Max Baucus when he was, I think, the chair of the Finance Committee, which is a super powerful position in, in the Senate. So he's got, had, he's had a lot of relevant DC experience and I think just ended his run for Congress in Montana, vying to become the Democrat to run to replace Ryan Zinke, Montana's one congressman who just became Secretary of the Interior. So uh, I don't know. That's all I got, but I'm excited to hear Dan's so story. This will be for, good. For, for the non-civic minded out there, do you just want to quickly explain how, how it will work out there, how, how they're going to replace Zinke and you know how, they, it's, yeah. how, how the layout is in terms of representatives out there? So my so Montana has one congressman because they're uh, not a very populous state. So they have two senators, one congressman. Their one congressman was Ryan Zinke, who just was uh, confirmed to become the Secretary of Interior. So now Montana will have a special election, I think, to fill his vacant seat. And my understanding, just from reading up on Dan West, was that the kind of the Democratic Party hierarchy would pick one uh, one person to be the nominee, like on the ballot, to run for this this vacancy, and presumably the Republicans will do the same. But maybe we can get Dan to fill us in instead of me just speculating about it. <laughs> but uh, and, and I want to put in, I, I want to mention what brought our attention to Dan, or at least my attention to Dan West. You you know a lot more than I do, Lewis, about the intricacies, but he made a a campaign video, you know, uh, this is why I'm running for Congress. This is why you should vote for me. And it was all about kayaking. So 
that's pretty rad. I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes if, if you're watching. But anyway, it's a pretty cool video. We'll let Dan explain the kind of the impetus behind that. But I saw, I saw some great Dan West memes on Facebook as well. <laughs> oh, I didn't see those. You'll have to send those. I'll link, I'll link those in the show notes too. Yeah, Super we'll find cool. them. Um, okay, so we'll get to Dan West here in a little bit. Uh, let's keep things moving along. We have some viewer mail. I thought that was the intro. What's that? <laughs> I thought that was our intro. That's well, all right. Well, well, we'll, get, we'll get to Dan West in just a little bit. But uh, we, we got to take care of our viewer mail. We've always got some great viewer mail. And next show, we're going to do just a viewer mail show. So... This is your chance to ask us a question, put in a comment, whatever it is that you want to know, talk about, or have discussed, and we'll do our best to, uh, to be on top of that. But this, this week's viewer mail comes from Simon Wyndham. Uh, Simon says, great interview with Corin. It will be interesting to hear where those guys and yourselves think whitewater kayaking is headed. Is there anything left to achieve or to make major changes or advancements with, both, with boat designs? For example, Corn's idea of the asymmetrical boat for C1 paddling. Or is every whitewater boat from now on going to be only a slight variation on what came before? Can whitewater boating be made more popular, or do we even want it to be more popular? And, and then that's in paragraph one. Here's the second paragraph. And here's a fundamental thing. Where will it be in 15 to 20 years' time? Will whitewater kayaking still be around, or will it end up being wave ski or of the river world, or the hang glider of the flying world? Will whitewater boaters be seen as those stubborn, geeky old guys in their cags and helmets taking up the rivers and looking really goofy, while everyone else is on some super development of SUP or atomic-powered jet boat or something? <laughs> Question mark, exclamation mark. Hmm. Mr. Weld? Boy, there's a lot to unpack there, isn't it? Uh, let's see. Um... Well, okay. So maybe do the second. I'll give you my thoughts on my second paragraph first. You guys can you guys can weigh on this as well, obviously. But uh, I think whitewater has, or I think kayaking has has legs. Like I think it's in for the long haul in terms of a sport. I'm not going to say it's going to explode as a sport, but it's going to be around for a while. Um, you know, and I'd compare that with something like. Uh, well, use like. Uh, Inland SUP is an example. And I know I'm going to get heat for this, and I'm willing to take it um, because I've seen similar things appear before in our sport. Um, even though whitewater is scary and people flipping over in, in the river is going to always keep the numbers down. Like you go skiing and you see whole families going out and having fun on skis in the first day. You, you know, the first week or so you spend in a kayak is for a lot of people a pretty scary endeavor. Um, even people are really desperately interested in learning how to do it. They're still intimidated by it. Um, so that's always been a barrier to entry. But there's something really compelling about running a river, you know, and that's kept our sport active and vibrant and our community alive for 30 or 40 or 50 years. And it's going to continue to do so. Um, I don't think that's going away. Um, you know, I, I think you get these sports uh, where it's there, there's a fad aspect to it. And it's an interesting piece of gear. And I... I know I'm going to take heat, but I'm going to say it. I think inland SUP falls into this category um, in the sense that it's not that interesting. You, you know? <laughs> I mean, a lot of people get an SUP you're, board on a lake. You're going to get know, so much heat for that one. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. But you go out on the lake and uh, you paddle around and you're like, well, okay. I mean – you know, and I think it, it, people a lot of a lot of those people are interested because it's, it has aspects of surfing to it, and it's going to be a great workout, and it's going to be it's going to build my core, and I can do yoga on this thing, and it's part of this outdoor lifestyle. But at the end of the day, the activity itself doesn't isn't something that you're going to want to do every day. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not saying it's not going to be an act, you know it won't be a, a viable marketplace for manufacturers and stuff, but I see a vast number of these inland SUP boards just sort of ending up in garages and rental homes and stuff like that. This is not to say that coastal SUP isn't something completely different. I mean, I think taking an SUP board out in the, out in the waves is, is a lot of fun. Um, I disagree with SUP analogy or not. I think there are sports that come and, come and go because of that. But I think whitewater has legs because I think there's an aspect to it that is really compelling. Let, let I me, think, yeah. let, go let ahead. Me, let me interject. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> you know, I want to use, uh, use skiing and snowboarding as an example. 
uh, when snowboarding yeah. was blowing up, uh, there was there was talk that you know skiing's days were numbered. It was just an antiquated sport that old people did, and you know snowboarding was going to be the thing. Now, certainly, snowboarding is established and it's around, but skiing is more popular than ever. And I think that's because the ski is the best way to get around the mountain. And I think the kayak is the best way to get around the river. So in my opinion, you know, it's kayaking is going to be around as long as there are clean rivers and places to go down. I mean, it's, it's the best tool for the job. As far as design, I think some, there could be some cool things done with skegs, but I think design is going to be, it's going to be materials. I think lightening and strengthening the boats. I'm not sure. I don't see a lot of vision personally on uh, on, on on big revolutionary design innovations. But it'll be iterative. I mean, we said the same thing 20 years ago, and look how far creek boats have come, or river running boats have come in that period of time, and play boats for that matter. Huh. You know, I mean, it's an easier sport to learn than it was 20 years ago. There's no oh, question about that. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, and, and I'll just yeah. tell you, I'll just tell you one of the greatest things. You know, and maybe this adds to something, but the dry suit, man, the dry suit has done more for whitewater paddling than pretty much any piece of gear out there. People are wearing out boats. People are wearing out paddles. People are stepping up to different designs and whatnot and venturing out. I just think the dry suit has just been a huge catalyst for the sport just because people can paddle and, you know, it's, it's crappy conditions when you're out kayaking. A lot of the times, not in in the winter time here on the East Coast, but like even in the summer, you know, you take a swim or something and you're just over it. But the dry suit just, I don't know, it's just been a game changer. It's just my opinion. That's interesting. All right. Listen, Geltman, I need some help with this this analogy I made because I'm, I'm just going to get beaten to death on this. I need someone to share the, the pain in terms of my SUP analogy. <laughs> you want me to back you up on that? Yes. I, need I don't a, know. I'm not sure that SUP is going to go away, but I, you know, it's I guess, not going away. It does, it does I don't think it's that. going away, but it's going to look like it's going to look like. Uh, you remember? Do you remember like sit on top kayaks were going to be a big thing, and then like recreational kayaks were a big thing, and then they are uh, big. You just don't care about them. Well, they but they are, <laughs> but they are, but you know the retail value of a of a sit on top kayak is about 150 dollars. You get it from Dix because that's going to represent the usability, you know, the 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 use of that craft. You, you know what I mean? Are you right. not seeing more and more people put on at the bottom of the loop and run the lower yacht in SUP boards? I mean, I think well, it's okay, be 50, I'm not 50. I'm not talking about river running SUP, which I is is another creature entirely, which I think is exceedingly difficult. You know, if, if anything above a class one rapid, it gets really tricky to run a river in, a, in an SUP board. And personally, I'm not sure if you're going to talk about enjoying running a river, why you wouldn't get in a kayak to do that. But that's I mean, entirely different. About, I'm talking about people who get these things to go out in the lakes. You know what I mean? Like, and float on rivers and stuff like that, which is, like S- which is driving this. That is the, you know, the, the economic powerhouse of, this, of that sport. I feel like SUP has this element where people think that it's it's like because it's close to surfing, it's like it makes them cool. Exactly. It's like it has this like – and that's like the fat element to me is like there's like something cool. Like you get your like nice long board shorts and you like throw a shotgun to your buddy and you like get in pat on your <laughs> SUP around the lake or whatever. We yeah. got to have some viewer mail about SUP. Like, kayaking, we don't have that, right? Like there's nothing cool. Like we're not cool. We're not like anybody else. Like – Nobody's like, oh, like I, I took a pack and like I'm, I'm, I'm really cool now. It's like, no, you're not. You just became a part of this like smelly, broy subculture, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you're gonna destroy your car and your relationship and disappear into like the backwoods of West Virginia. I think, yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> the worst possible image of kayakers, like from a non kayaker, would be like. You know, Mr. Extreme, you know, Mr. Mountain <laughs> Code Red is going to go out on an extreme day doing something extreme, and then we're going to go, <laughs> you're right, I mean, we're going to talk a waterfall, then we're going to do back, like a inverted aerial on our snowboard, uh, you know, like it's, that's the cliche. And, okay. and for the record, you know, I'm ready, I'm ready to be schooled by our SUP, inland SUP loving uh, listeners out there. You know, I'm I'm totally open to all sides of this discussion. Okay, right. my we should go back to the, the original question. Yeah. I don't okay. think anything is going to be that different. 
<laughs> okay, Lewis, yes or no, is Whitewater going to be dead in 20 years and no one's going to do it? No. Well? Absolutely not. No way. I'm um, not going to say it's going to go by 20% every year, but it'll still be kicking around. I'm in 100% agreement. So that's that's no's. Simon, your answer is no. You heard it here. Case closed. All right. You guys ready for some Dan West action? Let's do it. Dan West, man, he made this video. I've, I showed it to my wife, all my friends. Everybody loved it. We all wanted to vote for Dan West. Dan West for president. Let's see if we can get him on here. Dude, look how official he looks in his suit and tie and everything. I know. I'm picturing Geltman in a suit and tie. Yeah, Lewis, can you wear that next time on the show? I want to see you in character. My, my suit lives in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> I don't own a suit. Actually, I do. I have, I have a suit somewhere. Well, maybe you can have your mom ship it out just for, just, just for the show. Next time oh, looky there. Yeah. All right. I've never had a job. That's kind of the core thing is I've never had a job. <laughs> You've never had a job? You're I'm a job creator, John. <laughs> <All right. laughs> really? <laughs> huh. I like that. All right. <laughs> All right. We have uh, we have Mr. Dan West um, on the show. Dan, how are you doing? And thanks for coming on. I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. So, Dan, we, we, we uh, touched a little bit on uh, – Lewis knows a little bit about – uh, more about you and your history uh, and politics and whatnot. I just know you from the video that you put together um, for your campaign for the uh, for the Democratic convention there. Um, start by giving us a little history of uh, let's start with your history in kayaking and then we'll go into your history in politics. Um, yeah, well, I mean, first of all, thanks so much for having me on. It's it's an honor to be chatting with you guys. I've followed you guys you know, when I was in high school, in magazine, and, and uh, yeah, I grew up kayaking in Missoula. Basically, I, I went to World Class Kayak Academy as a student in 2004. I was classmates with uh, Tyler Broad and Ian Garcia, and just a bunch of like like cool Montana kayakers that came out of that generation. And, are still around today, you know. So, yeah, um, I I learned how to kayak basically from Scott Doherty, the original director of World Class, and and uh, yeah, went to school in Portland, Oregon. Chose to go there just to learn how to kayak. Um, I got Did you to go to school, uh, Lewis and Clark College. Yeah, so nice. I yeah I got to know uh, like LJ and Lane Jacobs and, and all those guys out in the out three go. Sam, no, uh, <laughs> of course, yeah. He, I, I took over the Lewis Clark Paddling Club, which is what he he went to Lewis and Clark ten years. Nice. Drevo learned to paddle from Weld. Yeah, he's an old Valley <laughs> Mill alum. Yeah, I kind of learned to paddle from Drevo. Well, a little bit from Drevo for sure. Taught me how to roll in the lake in Valley Mill. <laughs> yeah, and I've just maintained a lot of those friendships. So you know, I I, I came back actually taught for world class for a few semesters and then. And then uh, got into politics. <laughs> and how did that nice. happen? Yeah. Um, I, just, I mean, you were, you were on the fast track to, like, Dirtbagville. I, you know? <laughs> it was like, 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 like Peter Lodge or... <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, How'd you no, escape? Just, yeah, great. I, I'm still dirtbag at heart, I think. I... I uh, I moved out to D.C. I got an internship with Max Baucus, Senator Max Baucus of Montana. He was a senior senator, like six terms, chairman of the finance committee. So he was really powerful. Um, I, I was placed on his finance committee staff. Uh, we did, worked on trade issues, international trade issues. And um, and in, in, in some parts, actually, did work with the outdoor recreation industry, worked with Outdoor Industry Association. And, you know, one, one positive thing about our nation's trade balance. One thing that we do actually export and manufacture in our country and export is recreational goods. You know, so everything from backpacks and rock climbing gear to to kayaks. You know, the, a lot of those products, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, are made in, in the United States. 
so yeah, that was a great experience. Worked for uh, Max Bacchus for a year, and then I worked for Senator Mark Udall, Colorado, and he was on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, so big public lands, outdoor recreation portfolio through that. And because I had the kayaking background, you know, I was the one staffer there in the D.C. office that had, like, a connection to the outdoor industry. So that was fun, working for Mark Udall. He was unseated 2014, and then, uh, and then I got picked up by the Obama administration and worked at NASA as a legislative liaison um, up, up until January 20th. Wow. So you've had quite the career in politics so far. It was a fast, yeah, fast kind of three-step move there through D.C. in five years. But it was, uh, I was, yeah, just fortunate. So on January 20th, you knew this day was coming where you're going to be kicked to the curb, right? You saw, yeah. And so had you, when did, what point did you start thinking, well, a congressional bid may actually, something I'm interested in. I, that was just, you know, that was something that surprised everybody. You know, no, nobody realized Donald Trump was going to, select Montana's one congressman, Ryan Zinke, for right. interior secretary. Um, and it's rare that, that presidents pick Montana congressional delegates for cabinet-level positions. Like, we have three members of Congress out of 535, so what are the chances that they're going to pick someone from Montana, you know? Right. Um, interior makes sense, though, because it's a public lands agency, and, and uh, I don't know. I, we all started talking about it in December when he announced it. I mean, I was still working for another two months, but mm -hmm. everyone was talking about it. A lot of my Anna friends in DC are talking about it. And um, one thing just kind of led to another. I, I got done on January 20th. I took another look back at the race and what I saw was a void or a gap in the, the slate of candidates that had already declared. None of them had been really putting public lands front and center. In, in a serious way, and I felt like I could frame myself as an outdoor recreation candidate. I was qualified from my DC experience, and uh, it all kind of clicked. Like it, it, it all worked. They were all ingredients for us. It, I mean, it wasn't successful in the sense I got the nomination, but um, we definitely rattled the cage and like got the party's attention. And they respected us for putting forth a sincere effort. Tell me about tell me about some of the. Uh... What was happening on the inside? So, you know, you had this special convention and just tell me about your process and what, uh, uh, you know, just give me, give me your perspective on what happened there. Yeah. So that, that in itself too was, gave me the opportunity to do this because every state has a different process for filling a vacancy. And like some states have special elections that have primaries for instance, in Georgia right now, Georgia's sixth district is replacing uh, Tom Price, who became the Health and Human Services Secretary. They're having a special election, but their state law allows them to have a primary. So I think sometime in April, right now they have candidates running like a full primary. And the front runner for the Democrats is actually a young guy in his 30s who spent five years in D.C. And he kind of looks like me as a candidate. So it's, it's cool to see him as the front runner in the primary. The difference with Montana is that um, we don't have a primary for special elections. They just hold special conventions for each party committee. And the party committees select their nominee to run in the general election, the general special election. And uh, that's an interesting process because that's just 160 or so delegates from around the state that convene on a short time scale, but there's only 160 of them. And that that gave me the opportunity to like jump in late because there was really low barrier to entry. Right. As long as I was willing to court, you know, 160 or so just random people kind of hidden out in the woodwork out in Montana, you know, these county committees. There's just Democrats out there, you know, you have to go find them. <laughs> What's your, I mean, what's your sales pitch about yourself to these people? I mean, what are you, what are you, what are you telling them that they want to hear? Yeah, well, uh, I had a couple pitches, you know, like one, I was like a fresh young candidate. It's no secret that the Montana Democratic Party and the Democratic Party in general have short benches, you know, at the state level and at the federal level. Like we need to bring young blood back into the party. So I represented that. I, I, ha I was the only candidate in the field with federal level experience. 
So I was the only one who worked on Capitol Hill who has relationships up there. And that's what this job was for. Um, and third, I, I had, a, I think I had a qualified message, one that focused mostly on economic benefits to the state, uh, played down or focused less on social issues that tend to divide people. And, uh, and, and I had the training from Mac Collins, Mark Uvall, you know, to communicate that economic message. And one of the big ones, the winning one, I think, is public lands. Right. So public lands is kind of a, I mean, to us, it, it's, we kind of know what it means. You know what I mean? That has a, it's a certain code phrase, I guess, to a bigger issue. Um, but do you want to explain what exactly that's all about? I mean, when we say public lands, I think we're talking about a couple specific things. It, well, yeah, it, a couple specific things, I think, that are, that are winning campaign issues, like outdoor recreation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's such a broad, it, it's a massive, like, political topic. It encompasses, you know, so many states in the West. It's really a special Western topic because most mm -hmm. of our public land is in the West. And, uh, I mean, there's different, it's all there. It's just what ingredients you choose to pull out to, you know, highlight. And so I, when you talk about public lands, you talk about the economic benefit, uh, not just in, you know, energy development and grazing fees and, you know the income that those public lands generate, but also trying to trying to position outdoor recreation as as a an equal option for those economic benefits, and and that's a that that resonates with a lot of people, like Republican or Democrat. You know, people in Montana, people in Colorado, throughout the West, uh, love being in the outdoors. Right, and a lot of array of activities too, mostly hunters and fishermen, but. A small part kayakers too. <laughs> yeah, it's cool to see that, you know, especially I feel like Montana has been almost a leader in that, in that even guys like Zinke and Danes who, you know, in reality don't have the greatest track record on, on public lands, they feel compelled to sell it in, you know, they don't say let's sell off the public lands. They say we're never, ever, ever going to get rid of the public lands, even though, they're still going to push for, you know, energy development in a way that, you know, most of us would probably not like to see or, uh, you know, more local control than maybe we would like to see. But they recognize that the winning message on public lands is keep public lands public, keep them accessible, keep them there for everybody. And that's, you know, a real contrast to somewhere like Utah, where there are guys who still feel like it's a winning political message to say, you know, we hate the federal government. We want to take all the public lands. Like, we're done with this. Yeah. Sorry, we're kind of losing you. Oh, sorry. Can you, <laughs> are you guys? Can you hear That's me? better. Okay. Uh, I mean, in Utah, it's, it's starting to slip too. You know, the blowback against Jason Chaffetz and mm -hmm. public lands disposal bill. Like, they're starting to feel like they're on the wrong side of that issue too but I, I think that's really fair of you to say because that's what i've been saying too is is that zinke at least on paper and his his confirmation hearing he said he wasn't gonna he, he wasn't gonna do he wasn't gonna sell those lands off and he also said some really positive things about climate change too so which is so yeah. yeah i mean what do you think is going to happen with utah what's going on out there you know i mean i it, well, look at the outdoor retailer show, you know, Patty pulled out and like everyone else kind of followed. And and then you have uh, Chaffetz, you know, having to withdraw his bill. You've got the Bears ears, you know, situation happening and playing out. Um, it's fascinating. I mean, and then and then what's interesting, too, about Utah is all the national parks they have there. So, like, you're not hearing a lot about the national parks, but they are a big economic boost to the southern part of the state there. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah. Hmm. Where are you, uh, you got any kayaking trips planned, Dan? Um, hopefully, yeah. I'm I'm planning to go back. I'm in Colorado right now, but I'm going back to Montana in a few days. Um, and I mean, we have tons of snow up there, so yeah. it's starting to melt. And there's just tons of great rivers around Missoula. The Locksaw River is might be my favorite river in the world, so I'm excited to get back there. So what's next? I mean, are you going to, is this, you going to try this again in a couple of years or what's the plan? Yeah, I don't know. I, 
you know, the party was really encouraging and they were glad to see us. You know, we didn't, we didn't come close to getting the nomination, but I think we surprised a lot of people by how well we did. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of people were like, I think you might get two or three votes, you know, we had <laughs> 17 in the first round. So, right. Uh, and that was only from basically like two weeks of campaigning. It was like two weeks of talking about it and then two weeks of actually doing it. Yeah. And, uh, it was a fascinating experience, man. Like it gave me a lot of hope. You know, I've been kind of, dismayed by the politics of last year, the past couple cycles, really. And uh, just getting back out there on the ground in Montana and, and having these like sincere conversations with people, even like, you know, some strong disagreements, but, but still like, yeah, just walking into random rooms, you know, around the state that I never would have gone to. Right. Yeah. So, so to do it properly next time, you're gonna have to raise some money, I guess. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so do we go to, uh, Exxon, or who are we looking for for <laughs> for money for the campaign? I mean, how does that? Work? I mean, I mean, like, it's um, an expensive proposition, right? I mean, how much money do you have to put together to run for Congress in Montana? And I mean, you would have to put together a couple million. Like, a, a, the, diff, the nice thing about Montana is that it's cheap to run there too, relatively speaking. You know, mm -hmm. Mark Udall ran against Cory Gardner in 2014. It was the most expensive Senate race in Colorado history. Hmm. Was, I think like close to 100. Oh, right. I remember. I can't remember. Maybe it was like 50 million, but it was like, holy cow, orders of magnitude larger, uh, you know, on the million than it would be to run in Montana. So how do you, how do you raise that kind of money with, with any kind of scruples, I guess, you know? I don't know, man. And honestly, like, I, I don't know if I could handle that. Like the fundraising aspect of politics is so distasteful. And I, I watch, you know, professional career politicians just like go kicking and screaming into their fundraising calls. You know, it never gets easier. And right. it's a continuous process. Um, I just... I mean, in Washington, did you see these 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 people who gave money? I mean, we this is a story you always hear, but did you see that, like, the people who help raise money for these campaigns actually ultimately get what they need out of the, out of the people they elected to help elect? Does that actually go down, or is it a little more subtle and nuanced than that? I, th I think it is affecting real change. And, and honestly, there are some good super PACs out there like you know Citizens United also opened the doors for like groups to turn out voters to form you know or like the climate I mean there's like there's there's also good super PACs out there right and it's not to say that so explain just for the non-civic minded out there what's this how's a super PAC work and what exactly is it well it's just an entity that that can collect money in in greater sums than a political campaign but right. that entity can be can advocate for any issue and yes, it advocates for bad issues, but there are some good ones out there too. And it, it's not to say, it's not to justify that that should be the, the right process for influencing politics, but mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that there's some that are like dedicated to like registering as many voters as possible or, you know, even the climate, the climate, uh, super back Tom Steyer that is, uh, it's well-intentioned, you know, League of Conservation Voters. But I, I mean, I don't think that's the solution. You know, it's not like it's just going to be piling more and more money on each side. So there's got to be like some reform, some overturn of Citizens United or some like mechanism, like like full disclosure of PAC finances, you know, some sort of mechanism that like puts a puts a, a limit on that. Just like the world, you know. So who... Uh Who's the Democratic nominee, and can you tell us like a little bit about him, and can you give yeah. us like a quick prognostication for the Montana House race? Totally, and and um, yeah, he, he's awesome. His name's Rob Quist. He's a little bit older, but he's a folk singer from Montana, very well known, uh, great musician, and uh, used to be part of the Mission Mountain Wood Band, and uh, maybe still is. But he's good friends with uh, Brian Schweitzer who's the former gov popular governor of Montana, two-term Democratic governor, left like 70% approval rating. And he's kind of coming in as a political outsider. But he's, I, I think he's a good, he's a good representative of Montana. You know, he grew up in Northwest Montana, played basketball on the reservation, like, like, is very soft-spoken, uh, connects well with people in rural districts. And I think that's a sharp contrast to the Republican Greg Gianforte, who's uh, a billionaire from 
from New Jersey. And he ran against Bullock last year in the governor's race and lost, even though he had all the money and momentum in the world. You know, so there's he. I mean, he he's not. I don't think he's the best person to represent Montana. Like he did bring high paying jobs to Montana. He started as a tech startup there, but Rob Quist is just a, is just a solid guy. So it's an interesting contrast between the two. I think coming back to the financing question, the fundraising question, you know, no, none of the democratic candidates would be able to go toe to toe with the Republicans in this race, dollar for dollar, you know, but they need to raise enough money to at least like sustain an operation and, I think you see it. You start to see the money speaking too. Sometimes, like in Obama's campaign and Bernie Sanders' campaign, they raised a ton of money off small donations, and and that speaks really loudly. You know that like they, I don't know exactly how how much they interacted with super PACs themselves, but if you just look at their campaign finances, it was constantly mostly a large amount of small donation, and that contrasted with. The Republicans, like you know, Mitt Romney, raised just as much money as Obama, but off way, a way lower number of donations because they were higher. Mm-hmm. Like, there are there are ways to like see the good. Like the money sort of tells the story too, in some ways. And hope hopefully, like Quist can mobilize some like high profile people. Maybe like Bernie Sanders could give him a shout out or something, and that would help bring some attention. Let me ask you this, Dan, as a, as someone who is immersed in politics and how does the Democratic Party, how do we achieve some balance um, back in politics? What do you think as far as a message, um, what do you, where do you think the focus of the Democratic Party as a whole should be to pick up some seats to just achieve a little more uh, balance within the government? Yeah, I think the Democratic Party has gotten – caught up a lot in like identity politics you know Obama was a minority Hillary's woman you know we're the party of diversity and and inclusiveness so that that means you know gender equality equality and that brings in a lot of different groups who identify differently but in that that brings us together that's what we have in common I don't think the Democratic Party needs to focus on that so much anymore like we've established ourselves as the party of inclusiveness and equality so like changing the message back to economic messaging and talking about how you know you can help build the middle class create jobs i know it sounds cliche but like but that's what a lot of people are worried about you know we all just want to have good jobs we don't want to have as much student loan debt we want to have our access to our public lands you know we want we want there is a line I said in my convention speech that was something like, we don't want tax loopholes for billionaires while we pay for potholes on our highways. You know, something like that. It was, I had it. Yeah. <laughs> That's gold. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> Thing on ed- public lands, infrastructure, those are like, unite. those are issues that help balance the country. Those are issues you can like, What's Montana do for money? I mean, how does it tourism and what else? Yes, yeah, tourism is a big one. I mean, my extractive industries are huge. I mean, timber and. Mining. I mean, Still. so you have to. I mean, any representative from Montana has to consider that. Of course, and but there's there's still opportunities there. Like, uh, would a mining operation out of hand not revote for a Democrat or not a Democrat? Uh, Montana's weird because in my mind, I'm picturing Montana politically akin to Kansas. You know what I mean? Uh, but it's not. It's it's it's. You guys have your senators, Republican and Democrat, right? Yeah, Democratic okay. governor. Yep. Only Democratic gubernatorial incumbent to win last year. So everyone wins. Huh. Yeah. So um, I, it's a balanced state. Like Montanans split tickets a lot. You know, they're not as loyal to the party to each party as much. They they I think they vote more on personalities. Yeah. And uh, and I. Yeah, it's a fascinating place. Like, I think Democrats really have a chance, and there's issues. There's a lot of Republicans. Like, I met with a lot of Republicans who said they they would vote for me just because I would be willing to protect public lands. Hmm. Yeah, pretty cool. Oh, you need it, you know. It's just like 
Um, there's, yeah, there's other issues that I think Democrats can just like be more tactful on, you know, gun control obviously is a big one. Um, it, it's, uh, it's just hard to talk about it. I just brought it up just now and all of a sudden it's like hard to talk about. But, <laughs> you know, like basically you just, you, there's a lot of single issue voters out there. A lot of them care about, you know, abortion. A lot of them care about gun rights. And you have to just know how to talk about them. How do you talk about gun rights? I mean, I mean what's the answer? Not, it depends on what state you're in. And I think in the West, yeah. you they don't make them a political issue. You know, like you, like you don't touch the Second Amendment. Mm-hmm. You don't touch it. And you yourself have have to know like enough about gun safety and and gun culture in the West to to you know if you're going to represent those people, right. You, you can't seem out of touch with it. Even, yeah. I mean, even if you do support common sense regulations like background check. So, it seems uh, like I mean, it seems like in the back of your mind, you're you're considering doing this again. I mean, I, there's definitely opportunities, and I, I was encouraged by the party to do that. You know, to to explore. But at this point, I think it's everyone's best bet to just help Rob Quist win. Like, if Rob wins. Mm-hmm. That's going to be huge. It doesn't matter yeah. who the candidate was. If a Democrat wins in Montana in spring 2017, right. big signal to the country. Yeah, I mean, I'll point out um, that after John Gray sold LVM, he sitting on a, t- <laughs> a tidy sum of money. I mean, I sort of the Charles Koch of, of paddle sports, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, I mean, if you needed a well to tap, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the LVM fortune is... <laughs> yeah, if you're ready to raise some money, quite, just let me know, Dan. quite substantial. I, mean, I, I, can, I could probably make you a little better video as well. So. <laughs> Pulls the strings. I can see the attack ads coming now. <laughs> Dan West, about backed by North Carolina billionaire John yeah. <laughs> Kayak holding to all these kayaking special <laughs> Like the whole time, it's um, man, you know, there's like creative ways to think about it too. Like I was talking with uh, some renewable energy developers out in the eastern part of the state. You know, one thing that's constraining the scaling up of renewable energy is a way to store it because solar and wind is so intermittent. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need some like sort of battery, but you can't build like a lithium battery the size of a building that would store a city's worth of energy. Mm-hmm. The best way to do it is this process called pumped hydro storage, which essentially just creates two reservoirs and the it fills the top one mm. and the wind is blowing and the sun is shining and then it empties out at night or when it's not going. And this is a design that reminds me very much of like Olympic uh, slalom kayaking parks. Oh, I see where this is going. <laughs> like secondary and tertiary economic benefits to you know basically a water battery and it's so its primary purpose is to store energy for the grid but like agriculture irrigation benefits having extra reservoirs there's nothing wrong with that and then if you have timed releases why don't you make the spillway like you know have you know engineered a little bit so it has like a play wave or two on it or like spirit falls yeah i mean john John grace has the money in his pocket right now to make that happen (laughs) you want to cut a check john grace let's talk about this dan (laughs) memorial water park (laughs) i mean seriously i think that's where the sport's going too you know like all this ball and stuff like <laughs> now you're just stepping into controversy, man. Right. <laughs> it's the John T and Chelsea C Grace Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let Dan talk. I can't hear. <laughs> we just we can just rip on Grace for another twenty minutes. I'm gonna do that. <laughs> well, I, just send me a new spray skirt. <laughs> that's just one example of like a creative idea you know yeah. that could affect a lot of policy things but also make more accessible to to the masses no i i understand I, I fully get that and there's some uh there's some hydro projects around here around in lake joe cassie and some other places that are using that exact same fundamentals right now with some solar farms and whatnot so Totally. Um, have you guys ever paddled up at uh, 
ASCI up at Deep Creek Lake in Maryland. Uh, these guys have. Yeah, classic double tiered. Yeah. Pump system. That's yeah. maybe a little less efficient than being run by renewable energy sources, though. I know. I <laughs> that's being fueled by, I think, uh, <laughs> various I real estate Ponzi schemes around, <laughs> around Garrett County. <laughs> I've heard uh, I've heard Mark Singleton describe <laughs> pumped whitewater courses as reverse hydro projects. <laughs> <laughs> it, like our, there might be like, Charlotte. I mean, Christ, yeah, Charlotte. You could. There might be a way to just power that all with renewable energy, but then I don't know. I think Charlotte. Turbines, you'd have to put the turbines above the foot. I think Charlotte might be powered by wind. Is it? Oh, well, I mean, they say that, but I mean, who knows how that actually pans out, right? It's like all fungible. It's like you can buy wind renewable energy tax credits or whatever, and it all just comes off the grid. But they, they claim that they powered off wind. It's true. And I mean, there's still a lot to figure out. Like, there's a coal fire power plant in eastern Montana that generates two gigawatts of energy and baseline, baseload energy. And like, you know how many wind turbines you'd have to build to replace that baseline energy, assuming they all run for maybe like a third of the day or something, you'd have to plant like 2000 windmills, which is doable, but I don't know. These things take time. Like they're definitely, there's going to be like kinks to work out and there's no one single congressman who can really like change that. You know, you have to like dive into Congress itself and work to get bills passed there. That's, that's the objective. And it's still really hard, but I think honestly, there's like, there's Republicans that love renewable energy. I was driving through Wyoming and there's windmills everywhere. And they're generating windmills ever right here too. Pennsylvania is loaded. I don't know how that happened, but all of a sudden there's a million windmills around here. It's because it makes money. It makes money. Yeah. Yeah. So should we, we be concerned about the uh, new EPA guy? Is this a concern for us? Or should we just, uh, (laughs) just, just bury our heads in the sand. And <laughs> we need to save it. this for another issue because we could go. Right. Well, tell I mean, us, tell us your, yeah. what, tell us, Dan, what's going on? We're, we're cool with the EPA, right? I Everything's know. fine. I think it's a negotiating tactic. I think they're just staking out like a really bold position so that they can get like 80% of what they want. And then we'll, we'll be happy to be prevented the EPA from being dismantled, but. We'll only cut down like 80% of the trees. <laughs> it's the clean air and water. How many trees do you want? Really? I mean, I grow back, but... <laughs> only, only 80% of the Potomac River will be on fire in five years. <laughs> One thing I was concerned about that Zinke did was right away he like repealed that lead ammunition ban. That's so which, weird. It's just weird, and it's a weird, trivial topic, but like it's symbolic. And... Yeah. Well, Dan, we are running out of time. I know you have a plane that you've got to catch. I certainly appreciate you coming on the Hammer Factor, and uh, man, props on you for your campaign. And it was awesome talking to you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you, yeah, guys. Thanks. It's an honor to speak with you. Yeah, I'd love to come back anytime if you want to talk more kayaking and politics but awesome. political correspondent quickly yeah. what's next man what are you what's next for you helping out rob quist man yeah nice awesome that may 25th is our special election you know anyone who's listening to this if you want to if you're a kayaker come to montana in april and may there's awesome kayaking and there's also some you know democratic organizing that we can use some help with because i want to move to bozeman so maybe you can pull a few strings and get me some tax break there or something but i'm ready you need me to write you a check too well i mean yeah we are. <laughs> <laughs> we have the most equitable tax structure in the in the country so yeah that's tax my dream is to move to bozeman one day but you also move to montana and come out here before may 25th and help people register to vote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right well, on. Th- well, thank you so much, Dan. Man, we'll uh, we'll hope to see you on the river. Yeah, cool. thanks, Dan. Take Cheers. care. Thank you. Bye bye. There you go, Dan West. Man, cool. Seems like a good dude. Yeah. Why can't all politicians be that accessible? <sighs> I don't know, no, but he was he was really. What cool. do you think, Elvin? What's your what's your litmus test? You deal with politicians all the time. What do you think? Um. 
I had my heart's broken that Dan West is not going to be in Washington D.C. Man, I uh, I was really looking forward to Great Falls laps with the next congressman from Montana, but uh, <laughs> maybe next year around. But I don't know. No, I I think it's really good that you know people with that mindset are, are running for Congress, and I I hope that there's you know more of that in the future and people getting involved more locally and you know I mean there's even things down to like, like county commissioner or uh, you know state rep or state senator. It's like I, I think getting more younger people with that you know mindset for public lands and you know liberal politics. Like I hope we I hope we see more of it. I hope. I think Dan's yeah. got a, uh, a bright political career, man. He seemed like a cool cool cat. Yeah, I mean the thing that to me that seems so wild about it is it just seems like to be con- you know to be elected you just need like such the right confluence of circumstances, right? It's like you need the right district where, you know, where the politics sort of match up with, you know, what you want to do. It's like, you're not gonna, you know, like here in Hood River, our Congressman is guy, Greg Walden, who's, you know, he represents like the entire Eastern two thirds of, of Oregon. And it's just very conservative and he's, you know, totally out of step with our values here. But, you know, much more in sync with, you know, folks out in the eastern part of the state. And we, you know, I don't know how you would ever get someone like Dan West to, you know, beat Greg Walden. And it's like, you have to be in the right place at the right time, you know, for things to kind of line up. And I I don't know how you sort of surmount those obstacles, I guess. Well, but, you know, it takes time, I guess. And, you know, start, start local. I think that's a good, good plan. I know that there's a lot of local grassroots stuff going on in this area that I think it's going to be successful next year, but you know. Yeah. I mean, if you want to be glass half full about things, it's definitely exciting to see people kind of, kind of coming awake to this stuff and getting more involved. And, you know, if we survive the next, however long, you know, maybe things will get better. (laughs) (laughs) My 11 year old had to do a career day and he wants to be a politician now. (laughs) Uh, and so he had like, they had like a government thing and he was like, Oh, that's what I want to do. It was like, he spent the entire day, like listening to like civil servants lecture. And he was like, I don't, he, had a, he, he had no idea what he was getting himself into. Oh, well, awesome. Pretty cool for Dan West. We got to get some more politicians on the show. I mean, like I want to get some like legitimate or in hatch. <laughs> I have a few things I want to say to that guy. Where do you stand on running the shit? <laughs> What's your cutoff? Four feet? Four and a half? Or um, Mr. Hatch. Can you commit right now to running the little white with me today? <laughs> Mr. Hatch, have you seen the uh, the new piranha boat? <laughs> have you have you been it? have you been in the Mac now? <laughs> so, what are we gonna do here? Um, should we start wrapping it up, or are we gonna we want to kick this this subject off to next week? This this. Well, let's let's we were gonna talk a little bit about the style article on Site Z, uh, Site Z dot com website that Lewis Geltman wrote, which was a really good article that I believe. Was, there was a lot of chatter and engagement and circulation about that article. I don't know the exact stats on it, but. It was huge. It was read fifty or so thousand times and several hundred comments. Yeah. So we'll, we'll and countless emails from people. Well, check out check out siteZ.com if you're listening to this, and we'll we'll touch base on that next week. I think we'll have yeah, more, t- read, more time with that. Yeah. Read the style article by Lewis Goldman. It's quite good, and um, I feel like there's more to be said about that. But uh, yeah, so you, you could everyone has some homework to do. A reading assignment. Oh, hey, Gelman. By the way, speaking of politics, and we'll move on to the to the closing here. Did you read the uh, Catherine Schultz piece in the Yorker about what happens when you call or write your elected officials? I started reading it and I didn't finish it. I'm embarrassed to say, but maybe we could read that and talk about it also. Okay. Another whole like assignment, a, everyone. New Yorker, Catherine it Schultz. Was, it was a typical New Yorker style where it's like. 
Like the history the of the phone, phone began. <laughs> <laughs> Phones were invented. <laughs> You're like, okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> right. It was a cold November when I first discovered <laughs> uh, calling your phone people, and then suddenly it's twenty thousand words later, and you're. <laughs> yeah, I, I, but still, it was re- revealing because uh, you know the organization you work for employs some of these techniques to contact your Congress people, and, the, and it sure seems like some of them were of, of negligible value. So, interesting. I don't. I don't agree with that. But I will. Uh, I will reread the article. We can argue about it. Let's go around. All right. All right. Leaving podcast. I want to touch on the Mac. 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 No. Oh wait. Okay. All right. We do. So you're gonna. Well, go ahead. You paddle the boat. We'll get into rants and raves, everybody's favorite part of the show, coming up here in just a second. But a little backstory, if you didn't hear previous issues. Um, somehow it got brought up, the Macno, and I compared the Macno to a flat-bottom wave sport descent. And the <laughs> Macno... <laughs> if you know what a what a what a, what a it actually is, is, a, is a, the song with a tremendous amount of hull rocker <laughs> yeah exactly or stern so, rocker rather so i kind of you know and, and i'll admit a little bit unfairly uh ripped into the design and i didn't really mean so much that design in particular i meant the direction of creep boat, creep boat design you put quotes you had quotes around Mock no when you said it. Yeah, yeah, but nobody right? saw that. <laughs> so anyway, Rob Pearson, who, who we will have on the show, awesome guy, in, in my opinion, one of the greatest designers of the modern era. He is so such a uh, – how do you say it? I mean he's uh, he's got mad skills. How do you say it? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean like he's had so many good designs and I raved hardcore on the 9R – the direction of that design. And then the Macno came out later. And anyway, Rob listened to the show. It was forward to him. And he sent me a text on my phone basically being like, Grace, you got to try it before you knock it. That's how it works, douchebag. And blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> anyway, he was like, I, I got one here. Take Fair it point. Out. <laughs> Take it out and try it. So anyway, you know, anyway, I, I grabbed the boat. Long story short. I grabbed the boat, took it out for a lap, and uh, it's a good boat. It's super stable, super stable platform. It's uh, like a monster truck. It'll drive over over pretty much anything. Um, if you're the kind of guy who paddles a play boat and then you go to your creek boat, it's gonna feel really. Uh, it's gonna feel really. You're gonna be able to jump right into it, and it's not gonna feel that much different. <laughs> but I will stand by. My original, it's a good, it's a really good boat, but I just think that it has, I just think that in all boats, not just this particular design, that there's, Here we go. That, there's, <laughs> that, that there is too much stern rocker in modern creek boats. No, man, you're wrong. I'm 100% right. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I used, I used to be like you, but I realized I was wrong. Well, let me finish. The problem with Stern Rocker is you land a drop and it feels like you're sinking into one of those BMX foam pits. Exactly. You're trying to crawl crawl yourself out of that thing. Yeah. You got to land with your back down. It's a new style. And you come out fast. Look, okay. Now, see. You can, like, get it up on the stern, like, the way you're doing, like, the way you would do a downstream in an eddy in a slalom boat. You can kind of just get the bow up. You know, any nine foot boat is going to be easy to boof. Like, you don't need more rocking to make the boat boof. That's but, what I'm saying. But it just paddles, you know, like some of the new Waka designs compared to that original two to one. Like, what's missing is that massive amount of stern rocker. And, like, the stern rocker was what made that boat so good. And, like, when I first saw it, I was like, this is stupid. Like, why do you need that much rocker? It's just going to make the boat slow. But there's, like, some magic to it, I think. Yeah, I got to disagree with you because I think what happens is it's fine. It does make the boat booth easier. It does um, – you, you don't ever get stern tap and things like that, so you don't have to carry as much speed over the lip. You can approach the lip with more speed, and it's more forgiving. But when you start increasing the volume and you start to get bigger holes and you need to bridge and get out a little further from the lip to actually clear the hole – 
I think that when you have more stern rocker, you're less likely to punch out and you mush down. And so that's my opinion. And I also think that when you have that big stern rocker, your ass always wants to pass your bow. And, All right, let me ask you a question. Check. All right. Geltman, would you rather paddle a Machno or a uh, 9R on the Stikine? I've never – I've paddled the 9R once and I've never paddled the Machno. So <laughs> for what it's worth, I uh, – Theoretically, you have to pick one. Slight unseen. Probably the 9R. Grace? 9R. 9R is a killer, about- killer design. Yeah. And I like the Machno. I'll, uh, I'll I'll get a video together of my run the other day. I mean, it was like a monster truck. It, it's a good boat. I'm not saying anything against the boat. It's a good boat. It's like a lot of creek boats. They're great. But I just think that, like you say, in a nine-foot boat, you don't need that much stern rocker to have the ability to boof. I think you need a healthy amount of bow rocker, but I think that you get more speed and you can bridge more holes and you can more effectively get through big features with less stern rocker. Yeah. I'm old school, man. I like like a good, solid 13 feet of boat, boat in the water. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> 11 to 12, 12 and a half feet is kind of my cutoff. Uh, these I'm modern boats the don't have enough keel. <laughs> <laughs> like a big, I like that, like a V. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, Rob, I love the map now. If you're listening to this, go out and demo one. Give it a try. It is a good platform. In my opinion, nine foot boats need less stern rocker. That's Next it. week, the Antics, right? Next week, the Antics. Yeah, I did. I, I spent some time paddling the Antics, too. I paddled the Antics back-to-back with the Party Brap, and it was an interesting comparison. Well, yes. Well, yes. That one's a little longer than this one, so we'll have to wait on that yeah. one. Yep. What are your thoughts on the Antics, Lewis? Uh, always look like you've been having a good time in it. Definitely. It seems like more of a... Uh, Playboat influenced river runner, where the brat seems like more of a slalom boat influenced river runner, and that slalom style is more my style. So I, I'm, I'm not. The, the antics isn't that compelling to me, but I think for somebody with a different battling style, I see why it would be. Yep, I think you're right on there. I don't oh. like the um, anything that's too easy to stir and squirt. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably bailing on it. Like I like to be able to stir and squirt, but I want to, I want to work, have to work at it. You know what I mean? And if someone who could just get off the couch and never stir and squirt in their life and do a stir and squirt in flat water in that boat, I'm, I'm, it's probably going to be too short. Yes. Okay, we'll dig into that next week. All right, moving on. Rants and raves. Yes. Weld. Go for it. I got a rant. I prepared. I did my homework this week. All right, what you got? Okay, I'm going to rave about do-it-yourselfers. These are the guys that call me and they're like, hey, I'm trying to build my own skirt. I'm trying to build my own jacket. I'm trying to sew my own shirt or even just trying to do their own gasket replacements. Those are the people that I want to give a shout out to because I love those. Those are my peeps. You know what I mean? And I think the sport is lacking that. I think, well, I think the entire country is lacking that, but I think, I think our sport needs more of those types of people. And I think anybody who's ever called I or looking for help has had a chance to talk to me. They know that I'm always trying to bend over backwards. They need fabric or whatever helping. Now I'm not, asking for a thousand phone calls people ask me to give them free stuff but um i think it's awesome because you know i was was thinking about corin and talking about how he used to make boats and you know that was a a popular thing you make your own skirts and and uh that's really cool it's funny it's like almost in a way it's like it's sad but sort of like natural that it kind of dies off a little bit because it's like you know 20 years ago or 30 years ago you probably could make a better paddle jacket than you could buy off the shelf and you know? was, I mean, the people who were making paddle jackets back then were doing it on equipment that you could go out to Sears and get yourself. Right. You, you know what I mean? It wasn't like a super complicated endeavor, you know? Um, and now it's sort of, it's like a deterrent almost that the stuff that you can buy is better than what you can make. But just like, that was, you know, like our original conversation about, about the, you know, the, the email that we got about the direction of the sport. It's like, to me, that was what I kept thinking about is, for the designs to change, the manufacturing has to change first in a way that makes like experimental design more cost feasible. I mean, Whittemore, the guy worked just where works for me, you know, 30 years ago, he wanted a slalom boat that he could, you know, that was a half inch lower. So he made it. He just made it. You know, he just figured out how to do it. He did it. 
and he changed the sport as a result. You know, one person. Um, I don't know. I can't think of. I, I I got one guy locally around here who's making his own plugs and designs, and making boats for himself. But I mean, do you guys know people are making boats on their own, like designing their own boats and making them? There's a few people around around Asheville are that are doing it. Um, yeah. yeah, but you know, it's they run into they'll take them out every now and then, but it's not the boat that they paddle all the time, just because you know they're they're breaking and repairing them and all that stuff. Right. But but it's happening. All right, what's your what else we got? Rants and raves, Lewis. Um, I want to rave about uh, John Grace's beard. (laughs) Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Very, looking very distinguished. You have like sort of an (laughs) Antarctic explorer look going. Before you came on, he had like like a bit of like (laughs) pemmican or maybe like a like a beaver pelt like stuck to his beard. And I had to like tell him to pull it out. He was yanking stuff out. Of it. It's got like a like a very revenant aesthetic to <laughs> That's it. That's exactly what Will said. Yeah, I was like, Chelsea's out back, like skinning a mule right now. You know, like, like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, like we'll see. I haven't trimmed my hair or my beard or anything since. Been, I haven't trimmed anything in a while, so we'll see how long. It's getting hot now, though. You know, like I was out on a bike ride the other day and it was a warm day and it was it's days are numbered but i'm into it man yeah good work man thanks lewis well i got a rave about a book okay Every rave, so. okay. yeah i got a rave about a book it's called the charlatan and uh <laughs> i don't have the author's name in front of me it's pope somebody um but anyway oh yeah, yeah i know this book have you read it no, it's on my list though. I have it on my Amazon list. Dude, it's really good. I listened to it. I, it was just an audio book and I, I was – while I was running or whatever, I was listening to it. But it is a very good bo- book and it's about – basically it's about – it kind of reminds me of the era that we're in now when we talk about the EPA and getting rid of the EPA and it's all about the common man power and anybody who's an intellectual. It's uh, – it's, this- this is the guy that had the radio tower built in Mexico and he was selling like – Yes, exactly. Yeah, the cure yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, that's just his, a dude for sure. His, it's called the charlatan? Yeah. yeah the charlatan. And yeah. ba- basically what – I mean he had a – he invented this surgery that killed yeah. a ton of men. He, he, had, <laughs> z- he had zero, he had zero yeah. um, experience as a doctor and he invented this surgery that was supposed to – you know, increase the viability of men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he killed, he Yikes. just, he, he killed like 2000 people with this, but it was in this era that, you know, there's no registering. Anybody can do it. People aren't that smart. Being certified doesn't matter. And eventually that's, it swung back the other way. And the, you know, you couldn't be a doctor without, you know, getting the necessary necessary certificates and whatnot. But I just want to rave about this book because uh, it is a lot of what I see happening right now in the political world. And uh, yeah, anyway, check out the uh, Charlatan. I I need to check out who it's from. I got to give some, hang on, real quick. I got to give some credit here to who. Pope Brock. The author is Pope Brock. So, uh, there you go. Is that uh, pretty much a wrap? That's a record record length right there, I think. Where are we at? Three hours here? <laughs> <laughs> well, as always, thank you for listening. Mission. Send us your viewer mail. We love viewer mail. We're going to go over a lot of viewer mail uh, next week. We're going to talk about the party brap and the antics. Remember to subscribe, and we will see you on the river.